Welcome to Behind the Headlines with the Times of Israel. I'm Matthew Kalman. Our guest today is Ephraim Zurov, the chief Nazi hunter of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the director of the center's Israel office and head of Eastern European Affairs. Dr. Zurov's latest book is Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust. Ephraim, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Uh, tell us, first of all, to what extent was Lithuania's Holocaust hidden? Surely everybody knows about the Holocaust in Lithuania. Well, in a certain sense, you're right. Everyone knows about the Holocaust in Lithuania. But uh, what was hidden was the very extensive role played by the local collaborators, which the government, in the narrative that it fashioned when it became independent, has been trying very hard to hide. In other words, when the government, let's say, has a commemoration or an event, you would hear them say, in other words, the, the line is, this is a terrible tragedy, we lost our Jewish community, the Nazis came to our country, murdered our Jews. And if someone would press or, you know, ask, well, what about the local collaborators? They would say, these were marginal elements of society, these were degenerates, they're not part of us. Actually, that's one of the themes, in a sense, uh, certainly one of the themes of the book, but one of the themes that uh, Ruta insisted on emphasizing by putting two photographs on the cover of the book, which could be seen through the letters of the word Musishki, which means our guys, our people. One was of a Jew who had represented Lithuania in the, in the 1924-1928 Olympics as a cyclist. But as Ruta says, good enough to represent us in the Olympics, not good enough to live, because he was murdered in the Kovna ghetto. That's Yitzchak Anolik. And, and the other face was of a man named Balas Norvesha, who was the commander of the Special Ones, a murder squad which murdered 70,000 Jews in Ponar. And the message was that for Lithuanian society, neither the Jews, the victims, ah, they were a bunch of communists, they mistreated us, they exploited us, or the, or the killers, they're a bunch of you know, degenerates, people we have nothing to do with, a part of our society. And what I wanted to say, both groups are part and parcel and have been part and parcel of Lithuanian society. Now, you wrote this book with Ruta Vanagaita, and it's, it's almost a kind of a road trip, almost a buddy movie, the way the two of you set off to go and explore uh, this terrible, haunted house of Lithuania's Holocaust past. How did you meet her and, and, and who is she? Why, why did you want to write a book with her? Ruta Vanagaita is uh, one of the most popular authors in Lithuania, but her claim to fame is actually much more extensive. She was the producer of a, a cultural festival called the Life Festival in 1993, which was the largest cultural festival ever held in the Baltics. And this is shortly after independence. She later served as a political consultant and helped elect a president, a prime minister, and two mayors of Vilna. And she herself was elected to the city council of, of uh, Vilnius, of Vilna. And she was a newspaper editor and uh, a lot of, quite a, you know, very, very, varied uh, skills that she has. So she's quite a celebrity in, in Lithuania. But uh, what happened was that about six years ago, she discovered that two of her relatives, her grandfather and her aunt's husband, had been involved in the crimes of the Holocaust. And she was quite shocked, and uh, she was looking for a way to atone for it. And the first thing that she thought of was to try and help educate young Lithuanians, non-Jews, about the history of the Jews and their religion and traditions, etc. And she got a grant from the European Union to enable her to take them to the shul, the synagogue in, in uh, Vilnius, in Vilna, where they would be addressed by people from the Jewish community, experts, so-called experts, who, who could explain to them all about Judaism. Now, part of the grant was conditioned on having a conference on Holocaust education. So Ruta didn't know exactly who to approach, so she approached the people in Lithuania who deal with Holocaust education, and she asked them who should, who should she invite. So the answer was, you can invite whomever you like, except two people, Ephraim Zurov and David Katz. 
So David was someone who had come to Lithuania to teach Yiddish. Uh, initially had absolutely no connection to any politics, but when the Lithuanian government tried to put Jewish uh, partisans, people who had saved their lives by joining the Soviet partisans and survived in the forest on trial for war crimes or supposed war crimes, basically on framed up charges, uh, he, he, he decided to get involved and he is very active in terms of combating this distortion of the Holocaust. So she said, well, you know, what's going to happen if we invite them? Are they going to fight with someone? Are you going to fight with them? Or she said, they said, no, listen, it's just going to be unpleasant. We don't want to sit with them. We don't want to be with them. And Ruta being Ruta, a bit of an iconoclast, or maybe a big iconoclast, she decided, of course, that she has to invite us uh, after being reassured that there wouldn't be fistfights. <laughs> In any event, so uh, she invited me and... Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't come to the conference because I had already committed to a, a series of lectures in the United States. It was on, on Holocaust Memorial Day. But a month before that, I came to uh, Vilna to protest against the neo-Nazi march. And there are two such marches because Lithuania has two independence days. And on each independence day, the neo-Nazis march in a different city. In any event, in March 11th, there was Vilna. And I said to myself, if I'm already here, I may as meet this woman. I haven't been invited to speak in Vilna for tw more than 20 years. I'm not officially persona non grata, but I'm probably the most hated Jew in, in Lithuania. And all of a sudden, she's offering me a lecture to get paid even and have all my expenses paid. So I met her. And, um, and one of the things she said to me, which absolutely shocked me, was that she admitted that her relatives were involved in killing the Jews. Now, this, this was really highly unusual. I had been coming to Lithuania many times in the years since independence, and no one had ever said to me, I'd never met a person who admitted that someone close to them had been involved in these crimes. And since the number of Lithuanians involved in these crimes is huge, many, many thousands, uh, some, maybe even in other words, tens of thousands, so this is quite unusual. And the situation at this point was that I had tried for many years to get the Lithuanians to prosecute local Nazi collaborators. They had done everything possible to turn this whole process into a farce. We, we had run out of suspects already. So in other words, the struggle moved from the courtroom to the public arena and to education to the classrooms. So it became an argument over the narrative. What is the narrative of the Shoah in Lithuania? So I said to myself, you know what, listen, I, I can't win this battle. I'm a Jew coming from, from Jerusalem, a, a Brooklyn Jew, a Jew from New York, with a New York accent and a kippah on my head, and I'm trying to convince these Lithuanians that what the government is telling them is, is a lie, and they're very culpable for you know, so many crimes during the Shoah. I, I can't win the battle, I realize that. But one second, here you have Ruta Vanagakta, who's a Lithuanian, ethnic Lithuanian, not Jewish, and one of the most popular authors in Lithuania, who has a wide audience, many readers. Maybe if the message comes from Ruta, that'll make it palatable. So we started talking, we started, you know, sort of uh, considering different ideas. And what we decided on ultimately was to go on a mission to, we didn't know exactly how many, but it turns out to be more than three dozen uh, places of mass murder. And to uh, interview eyewitnesses, to see if the place can be found, is there a monument, what does the monument say, speak to people living right next to the grave, go to local museums, and uh, the places that we chose were based on our biographies. In other words, for Ruta, that's easy. She grew up in Lithuania. And for me, my maternal grandparents, both of them were born in Lithuania, and my, my mother's entire family was from Lithuania. And we made up the list, and we started. And we started going on the trip. Just before you set out on this trip with us, as you, as you uh, then chronicle in, in the book, just set the scene for us. How large was the Jewish community in Lithuania on the eve of World War II? how many survived, and what happened to those who didn't? Okay, so 
very often people make the mistake of saying that there were 165,000 Jews in Lithuania prior to the Holocaust, but that's not true. There were 165,000 Jews in the census in the Lithuanian Republic in the mid thirties. But in 1939, after Russia invaded Eastern Poland, they gave the city of Vilna, which had 60,000 Jews and the area around it, which was another 20,000 Jews, to Lithuania, and it became part of Lithuania. So the number rose to close to a quarter of a million. There were several thousand who ran away to the Soviet interior. There were several thousand who were deported by the Lithuanians together with the, the bourgeois, the enemies of the state, the bourgeois, the political activists against communism, the nationalists, etc. So you had 220,000 Jews living in Lithuania under the Nazi occupation of whom 212,000 were murdered, which is the highest percentage, 96.4% of the large Jewish communities in Europe. And where, where did they die? Were they deported to the gas chambers? Very few of them. Actually, 90% of those Jews were murdered by shooting very close to their homes, usually within a half an hour distance. In other words, uh, right nearby. And Lithuania has 234 mass Holocaust graves. Now, 10% 10, 10 of the Jews were, at the end, in 44, after the ghettos were evacuated, they were deported a few to Auschwitz and Sobibor, but mostly to Stutthof, the women, the men to Dachau. And most of them died there. But you're saying that over a, a, the vast majority of Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust were murdered in Lithuania on Lithuanian soil. And so the question is, who did the killing? Okay, so there's no question that the Lithuanians played a very, very important role in the murders. First of all, let's talk about logistics. What we know today is that there were less than a thousand Germans serving in Lithuania during the Nazi occupation they are going to carry out an unprecedented mass murder operation, which will include, in other words, it is carried out by individual murder. It's not like you can push 100 or 150 people into a gas chamber, drop a canister of Cyclone B, and they'll all be dead in a few minutes. Every single one of these people has to be murdered. And they have to be murdered near their homes. Places have to be chosen. Places have to be prepared. And the people who did that was the local administration, which had been fired by the Russians when they came. And then the Lith leadership of Lithuania told those people to return to their posts and serve the Nazis. And they were in charge of the logistics. You have to find a site. You have to round up all the Jews. You have to hold them in a certain place. You have to choose the date of the murders, organize the killing squads, bring the Jews to the place, murder them, cover the grave, then deal with the property, with the possessions, with the belongings. And for that, to murder that number of people, you need thousands and thousands of people. So you had on the top of the pyramid, you had the political leadership, which was inciting against the Jews because many of the political leaders ran away to Berlin during the Russian occupation. They formed this umbrella organization called Lithuanian Activist Front. You had the local administration, which served the Germans, and you had the killing squads. So in your estimation, how many Lithuanian Holocaust war, war criminals were there, and how many have been brought to trial? My estimate is around 20,000, excluding the people who benefited from the theft of the property and the belongings. Those were people who rounded up Jews, who took Jews to be murdered, who murdered Jews. There were many cases in which the murders were only Lithuanians. There are some cases in which the only Germans present were, for, for ta were taking photographs, but not pulling the trigger. And then there were cases, of course, where it was SS men from uh, the role commando of Heyman, ironically named, commander was named Heyman, which is quite ironic, of course. Uh, and, um, and together with Lithuanians. So of those 20,000 uh, estimated Lithuanian war criminals, how many have been brought to trial? 
Okay, first of all, many of them were brought to trial by the Russians, by the Soviets. And there is extensive documentation on those trials. Now, not in every case were these people tried for killing Jews. In some cases, they were tried for political, uh, political crimes, which meant joining the enemy, joining the Nazis. But in, in quite a few cases, it was clear that they had murdered Jews. And that's part of the record, the, part of the record. After that, um, a few, for example, were prosecuted in America after they emigrated to the United States. But in America, you couldn't prosecute them for the crimes themselves because the crimes were committed outside the United States and the victims were an American. But what they did was try these people for immigration and naturalization violations because they had lied on their immigration applications later when they became citizens. So it's interesting because the American uh, authorities had quite a bit of success with these Lithuanian cases. And almost all the people who were stripped of their American citizenship and ordered deported went back to Lithuania and could have been prosecuted by the Lithuanian authorities on criminal grounds because there was no statute of limitations. And, and were they prosecuted? Okay, three were prosecuted. A out of how many? Two, out of 15 who came back from America. Right. Okay, um, but I mean, there were so many others. They were in Canada, they were in Australia. I even found some in New Zealand. Um, where else? In the UK? In the UK, I found one of the officers of the killing, of the killing squads and, and others, yeah. So uh, in your estimation, how many of those Lithuanian Holocaust war criminals managed to escape justice out of the 20,000? Uh, I would say 90%. 90%? Maybe 93%, 95%, yeah. Okay. So, so this really was something that wasn't directly dealt with either immediately after the war or by Lithuania, independent Lithuania in the 90s, that this is something that's been left to, to fester. And, and, and so you set off on this journey to find these, these killing grounds, as you say, uh, nearly, nearly 300 of, of them. And when you got oh, to the- 234. Sorry? 234. 234, sorry. <laughs> okay. so, so you set off to find these killing grounds, 234 different sites around the country. And when you got there, did you find people who were actually willing to talk to you after all these years? Okay, first of all, we couldn't go to all the sites. That was obviously beyond our capabilities. We went to about 40 sites, five of which were actually in Belarus, because what most people don't know is that a Lithuanian unit was sent in October 1941 to Belarus to murder Belarusian Jews. And they killed, they liquidated the Jewish communities in 15 different places, and at least 20,000 Jews were murdered. They're actually mentioned in the Nuremberg trials as a document that the Gebietskommissar of Slutz, a German named Karl, uh, Karl is his family name, uh, appealed to his superior in Minsk to never send this unit to his area again because they created such havoc and such panic in the local population that the people thought that after they killed the Jews, they're going to kill them. Okay, so of the uh, of the of the uh, forty or so sites that you you did go to, did you find people who were uh, yes. willing yes. to talk to you? And what yes. did they tell you? As a matter of fact, almost everyone we met was willing to speak to us. And invariably, when we asked who committed the murders, they said Lithuanians. It was Lithuanians who shot the Jews. There's a there's a story that you tell. I think it's in a town called. Uh, Svezonis, uh, Svezionis, sorry, who, who, uh, uh, of an old woman who you bumped into outside a grocery store. Um, that was heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, I saw right away that this woman looked old enough to be of the age where she could, might remember something from the war. So I don't speak Lithuanian, so I told, to, told Ruta, so, you know, speak to her, ask her, does she remember anything? And she, and she spoke to her, and she told her that uh, she was from a family of two girls. One, her, and she had a old, much older sister. She was about seven or eight. And they were friendly with the Jewish family, which also had two girls about the same age. And when the decrees against the Jews started, the measures being taken against the Jewish population, in her home there was a discussion, a very intense discussion about the possibility of perhaps saving her young friend, her seven-year-old or eight-year-old friend. Family was called Bensky, I remember. And um, 
So I said to her, through, through Ruta, of course, I said, you, you must have been afraid of the Germans. So she said, no, we could have hidden her from the Germans forever. We were afraid of our neighbors. And she started crying. And we were, had tears in our eyes. It was obvious she had never told the story to anybody. It was like sitting on her heart, like a huge boulder. And finally being able to tell this story to someone who was sympathetic to her, to her, her sorrow, I think it, it sort of liberated her in a certain sense from this heavy burden of, of guilt that she couldn't save her friend. Now, you've been chasing Nazi war criminals for a long time and trying to bring them to trial. Uh, but it, as you say, this, this trip and the book that came out of it is a little bit different because there you weren't really looking for the criminals themselves. You were looking for witnesses to what had happened in, in these places. So in what way was, was this trip different from previous trips to Eastern Europe? So this trip was devoted to establishing the veracity, the truth of the historical narrative. I didn't anticipate finding any criminals. I didn't anticipate finding any witnesses or anything. I, I, I myself realized that this chapter, in Lithuania at least, not in Germany, for example, but in Lithuania, this chapter is closed. And uh, what remains to do is to fight for the historical accuracy of the narrative of the Shoah. And if anything, we felt 100% uh, strengthened, um, you know, uh, reinforced by every, all these people that we met who said, who told us exactly what we knew. I mean, we knew it to be true, but we, we were looking for verification. A verification from objective, from objective uh, you know, bystanders or, you know, witnesses. So th this is, this was, the, it was a change in a sense, a very, very important change from what I normally would do. And you also had a personal connection with these places because your own family, I think a great uncle who you're named after, uh, actually came from one of the places that you, that you visited it. H how was it revisiting somewhere where you weren't coming as a professional Nazi hunter, but actually as a family member to, to a place uh, where tragedy had befallen your own family? Okay, let me, let me just tell you a, a little story before that. Um, one of the most dramatic moments I had as a Holocaust researcher, I was doing, actually doing, writing my doctorate, was when I found the address in Vilnius, in Vilna, of my great uncle, who I knew was murdered in, in, in Lithuania. And I went with Ruta to the house. It's an apartment building in the, in the center of town. And uh, we tried to get into the entrance where the apartment was. And uh, the, play, the, the entrance was locked. And then someone put his head, someone put his head out the window who was from the same entrance, from an apartment in the same entrance, not from the one we were looking for. And Ruta told him a story. Listen, this guy is coming from Israel. His, his great uncle lived here and he was killed in the Holocaust. And now he would, would like to see the apartment. So this person said, to, no, he, that's not true. I know who that is. He's looking for the bad guys. <laughs> anyway, so at some point, too famous, too famous, right? In Lithuania, not anywhere, not in other places. Uh, so at one point, he agreed to open the door to the entrance. Okay, we go up there to the second floor to apartment three, and uh, we're not going to. No one answers. So we go downstairs, and again, the guy puts his head out the window, and we say, "Listen, we want to thank you. Thank you for opening the door." He said, I still don't believe you. <laughs> okay, but um, th this, I think, is the, one of the most significant differences um, was for the first time, I was so personally affected by what I was doing. And I have to say that I always thought that when I'm busy trying to facilitate the prosecution of Nazis, I can't, under any circumstances, allow this to be personal. It's not Ephraim Zurov against Dinko Shakish, the commandant of Yasenovites. It's not Ephraim Zurov against 
Hungarian gendarmerie officer, uh, Shandor Kapiro, was involved in murdering thousands of people in Novi Sad, and outside Novi Sad, or any, any of these people. I have to, you know, not involve myself as myself. I'm coming on behalf of a cause, the cause of justice for the victims, and they're the target. But now, whatever wall, whatever, you know, barrier I was able to put up between myself and the issue crumbled. It absolutely crumbled. The emotional strain of going from place to place, day after, almost day after day, it wasn't, it wasn't 40 days consecutively, it was broken up into several, several troops. It, listen, it really, it really got to me. I cried more there than I think I've ever cried anywhere else. And um, it, also, it, it also affected Ruta, I think, because she viewed me as some sort of monster in the beginning, you know, and, and all of a sudden she saw the human side. And the human side was something that she felt too, because she, unlike the average Lithuanian, felt this deep bond to the victims of the Jewish victims of the Shoah in Lithuania. Now, you you wrote uh, just recently in the Times of Israel about the trial that's just concluded in Hamburg of Bruno Day, uh, who's an accused Nazi war criminal. He was convicted, and there was a very long verdict that was given there. Uh, but in the end, basically, he went unpunished. Uh, you've, you've spoken uh, about the impact of trials and the importance of them in bringing home to people what really happened during the Shoah and teaching people about Holocaust history in the way that a history book never would. But doesn't it seem to you now that we're coming to the end of this phase, that there, there, there aren't going to be any more convictions, or even, even if they are, they're going to end up with someone, you know, not going to prison or not being punished. It, have we reached the end of an era now? We're on the verge of the end. There will be more convictions because there are more cases. In the case of Day, he arrived in Stuttgart at age 17, so he was tried in a juvenile court, which helped soften, I think, the, the verdict. He was convicted. He was sentenced to two years in prison. The problem was that the, the sentence was suspended. Now, I read, I read the verdict, and I was in total shock after reading it because Judge Maya Goring wrote an absolutely brilliant defense of prosecution of Nazis. Absolutely brilliant. In, in other words, we're talking about we are now bringing people to justice who are not your high officers or even middle rank officers. These are people of lower ranks. These are people uh, who were not in positions of command. And she explained so well why it's still important to bring these people to justice. But then she suspended the sentence, which to me made absolutely no sense. And was on a certain level, and I'm sure it wasn't intended by her, an insult to the survivors, an insult to their narrative. And, you know, it's basically they brought a, they brought a, uh, psychiatric expert on, on uh, teenagers to try and analyze Bruno Day's uh, personality. And they said that he was immature. No. So, I mean, he's certainly old enough now to understand why he should be punished, right? <laughs> no, and she pointed out, she was brilliant. She said, the only thing that made you cry was the monotony of the job and the fact that you were far away from your family. Nebuch, mamash, bali livkot. I'm saying it's crazy. I, you know, it's like maybe I should cry for him. You know. So this was a very big disappointment. I was very impressed with her. I was at the trial several times. I was quite impressed with the way that she conducted the trial, and and I was super. To be honest, I couldn't believe my eyes when I read it because it was it was so powerful. I I'm telling you, that's a document that should be read in every, in every school in Germany, in any country where you have a trial of a Nazi war criminal, read this document. You'll understand right away why it's important. As you look at the, as you say, we're, we're on the verge of the end of this era, and you, you've dedicated a lot of your life to this, to hunting right. down Nazi war criminals, bringing them to trial. So as this era nears its close, what's, what's next for you? 
Well, listen, first of all, I have a very daunting challenge that I've already assumed, which is the fight against Holocaust distortion in Eastern Europe. So it's not as if, you know, I'm going to have to retire and, and, and sip a pina colada in Tahiti or something. You know, that's not on the agenda. <laughs> and, uh, and the same motivation that brought me to, you know, the efforts to facilitate justice are certainly there for the same reasons to fight for the accuracy of the narrative. So I'm really happy in a sense that in the last two years, this thing has risen to the surface because of the, the bill in Poland. That's what made a very big change in the consciousness. IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, has made a point to speak out against Holocaust distortion. And uh, hopefully they'll finally you know, deal with it. Lithuania was one of the leaders. And I always, I always used to say, I used to describe them as a locomotive, pulling the train, because laws that were passed in Lithuania, for example, to deny that communism, for example, is a genocide or communist crimes or genocide uh, were immediately passed or shortly thereafter passed. The definition of genocide was changed in Lithuania to fit what happened in Lithuania. And sure enough, it was changed in Estonia, it was changed in Hungary, it was changed in Latvia. It took a little while. So Lithuania bears a lot of the blame and a lot of the guilt for leading this campaign, the Prague Declaration, which co creates a false symmetry between communist crimes and Nazi crimes, a declaration which calls for a, in a joint memorial day for all the victims of totalitarian regimes to be marked on August 23rd, the day of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. In other words, you innocent observer think that only the Nazis bear the, the a guilt for the 50 million people killed during World War II. Think again, the Soviets share the blame. So they want to compare the country that conceived, built, ran the biggest mass murder factory in human history, Auschwitz-Birkenau, to the country with all its flaws, and I don't want in any way to minimize communist crimes, which liberated Auschwitz and stopped the mass murder. So uh, there's still a lot to do. E Ephraim Zurov, the uh, chief Nazi hunter of the Simon Wiesenthal Center and author of Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank you.